Let me tell you a little bit about our speaker today, Dr. George Hillman here. Uh, he is Associate Professor of Spiritual Formation and a Director of Servant Leadership Internships. Uh, he got degrees at Texas University, Texas A&M University, um, an MDiv, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and then a PhD also. Um, Dr. Hillman has a passion for discipleship, spiritual formation, leadership development, and came to the seminary here with ministry experience in Texas and in Georgia, most recently as a pastor of spiritual development in a local church. And nationally known in theological field education, he is active in leadership of both Association of Theological Field Education, that's former steering committee member, he was, and the Evangelical Association of Theological Field Educators, former two-time co-chair, and he and his wife, Jana, have one daughter. Thing I like about uh, George Hillman is his joy. He's always joyful. I hope it's genuine. I think it is. <laughs> I think it is. He, he exudes the joy of the Lord. And you know, that's what we need. Uh, we need to show people that what we believe in is something that produces joy. And so would you welcome Dr. George Hillman with me today? <laughs> told Chaplain Bill that I thought I would see him out there chained up against one of the trees out there as the bulldozers were coming. So, but no, he did not. This past automotive model year, uh, the Jeep Motor Company reintroduced a Jeep Cherokee. Now, for you who are not Jeep aficionados, uh, Jeep was the very first sports utility company. And many of you know a Jeep Wrangler. That's the car that has no roof, no doors. It's just you, four wheels, and the wide open spaces. A Jeep Cherokee is basically a box on four wheels. It's not pretty to look at, electronic nothing, but it is a man's machine. My all-time favorite vehicle that I have ever owned was my 1990 Jeep Cherokee Forest Green. Electronic nothing, old school. It was something that was just a eye, it was something to behold in your eye. Well, you think to yourself now, why does George need a Jeep Cherokee? Does he have to forge rivers and climb mountains to get to work? No, I live in Frisco, flat, treeless, Frisco. But at least in my mind, to think of the possibility that I could at any moment get off of the paved road and trudge through the wilderness of North Dallas to get to Dallas Theological Seminary, that, that is what made my heart sing. I loved that vehicle. I finally had to give it up a couple of years ago because gas was just killing me. It, Jeeps are not known as fuel efficient vehicles at all. Well, one time, in the life of my Jeep, it actually got to live up to the expectations of what a Jeep is supposed to do. When you watch the commercials and the Jeep is hanging off the cliff, I did that one time. And, and, and trust me, it wasn't something I actually meant to do. So uh, for several years at my church at Bent Tree Bible Fellowship, I led our family camp and we would go up to Colorado to a, a lodge real close to the Monarch Ski uh, Resort. And one of the activities that we would do is that we would load up in all of our sports utility vehicles, get, go down to the town, rent bikes, and take the bikes up to a mountain pass, and then take the families down on a nice, gentle ride down the mountain. Nothing too adventurous, but gorgeous, gorgeous views. So we, this is my first time I've ever done this trip. I have the map, and it's called Marshall Pass. And there's actually two ways to get to Marshall Pass. There's one where you go to the right. It's a nice way, winding road. That's gonna be the one we're gonna come down. It's paved and it's aptly named Marshall Pass Road. But then there's a road to the left. And on the map, the road to the left looks quicker. I'm all about efficiency. And it was County Road 202. Now in Texas, when we say that it is a county road, we are assuming that it has some semblance of a road. It's either paved, or it's graveled, but it's, it's a road. In Colorado, when it says county road, it means that a bear at one time used this as a pass. <laughs> and it might be wide enough for a car, it might not 
good luck. But again, I see the map. I'm the leader. I'm in a Jeep Cherokee that is built for the wilderness. So I trudge up the mountain trail, followed by all the dads who are also in sports utility vehicles with names like Explorers and Tahoes and Pathfinders. All of us flatland Texan people heading up the mountain. Now, we leave the pavement, we get on the gravel, and it's going fine for a while. And then the gravel gets a little bit bigger. Not really a gravel road, it's more of a rock road, but we're all in sports utility vehicles. This is what God created sports utility vehicles for, so we're going to keep plunging on. And then we turned a corner, and it was straight out of one of the, the Jeep commercials. Nice 45 degree angle, all semblances of the road has left, boulders. And I have a decision to make as the leader. I have all these dads and all these families that are behind me. Well, you know what I did. By golly, I'm going forward. Because I can't turn around now because I've got all these other dads behind me. And I'm going to get my man card revoked if I turn around at this point. I've got to keep pushing forward. And so I head up the mountain. And at that point, all conversations with my wife has now stopped. Because she's looking at me going, you're an absolute idiot. What are you doing? And I guarantee in every one of these cars behind me, the Explorers and the Pathfinders and all these big manly sports utility vehicles, they're having the exact same conversation. They're sitting there saying, well, I can't turn back because George went. And if George went and I turn back, he's going to revoke my man card. And that was my trip up the mountain. Did we make it? Yes. But that trip is infamous in my family. If you ask my wife sometime to tell you about the Jeep. You see, the wise decision at that point probably would have been, you know, I need to take this other path. I need to go the, the known route. My wife was telling me that. I actually kind of knew that inside. But... I, at that point, I'm not listening to anybody. I'm not listening to my wife. I'm not listening to what my good common sense is telling me. I'm pushing on ahead. In my pride, in my stubbornness, in my bullheadedness, I as a leader am leading this other trail of people up a mountain. And it turned out okay. But there are so many times when, as a leader, that I have followers. And when I make stupid mistakes, guess what? My followers follow me and make the stupid mistakes too. Leadership is a, is a, is a daunting task. Well, King David had a Jeep moment. And you see that Jeep moment in 1 Chronicles 21. And, and there's a parallel passage that goes along with this in 2 Samuel. To set up what's happening in 1 Chronicles 21, this is later in David's life. The battles have been won. The enemies have been subsided. Um, even the struggles within his own family, this is after Absalom. The kingdom's at peace. The kingdom is at rest. He's an old man. He should be a wise man. But as you're reading along, either as you're reading along in 2 in second Samuel and it gets towards the end of 2 Samuel, or as you're reading along in 1 Chronicles, you get to this point and, you, and it, it's kind of shocking. You're like, well, wait a second. I thought David had outgrown this stuff by now. But David has his Jeep moment, just like we have our Jeep moments. Let me read the passage, and then I want to unpack just a couple of very, very brief observations. So it's 1 Chronicles chapter 21, starting in verse 1. It says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab and to the commanders of the army, Go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me a report that I may know their number. But Joab said, may the Lord add to his people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not my Lord, the King, all of them, my Lord's servants? Why then should my Lord require this? Why should it be a cause of guilt for Israel? 
But the king's word prevailed against Joab. So Joab departed and went throughout all of Israel and came back to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people of David. In all Israel, there were 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. And in Judah, 470,000 who drew the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin in the numbering for the king's command was abhorrent to Joab. But God was displeased with this thing and he struck Israel. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly and that I have done this thing. But now please take away the iniquity of your servant for I have acted very foolishly. And the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, go and say to David, thus says the Lord, three things I offer you. Choose one of them that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, choose what you will, either three years of famine or three years of devastation by your foes while the sword of your enemy overtakes you or else three days of the sword of the Lord, pestilence on the land, which the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all of the territory of Israel. Now decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, Oh, I'm in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel, and 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sent the angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw, and he relented from the calamity. And he said to the angel who was working destruction, it is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was standing by the threshing floor of Ornan the Jezusite. And David lifted his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven and in his hand a drawn sword stretched out over Jerusalem and David and the elders clothed in sackcloth fell on their faces. And David said to God, was it not I who gave the command to number the people? Is it not I who have sinned and done great evil? But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand, O Lord my God, be against me and against my father's house, but do not let the plague be on your people. The passage really speaks itself of what's going on. Now there's a theological quandary at the very first of the passage. When you read this passage in 1 Chronicles and compare this passage in 2 Samuel, and 2 Samuel says the Lord was the one who enticed David to number, and here it says Satan. Well, the theological ramifications of this is simply that God is sovereign. And God in his infinite wisdom and sovereignty allows this adversary to tempt David. There's six things, very briefly, that relate to the situation with David that relate also to us. Number one is that you will be attacked as a leader. Now, the word Satan in the very first verse is the word adversary. And you can read the passage either way. Maybe the adversary is an external threat, Satan mobilizing the nations around David, and David feels that there's a threat, and as a result of that threat, I've got to mobilize my troops. Or maybe Satan is attacking his own pride. And David is sitting there saying, let me count my men to see how powerful I am. But whether the threat is external or whether the threat is internal, the results are still the same. You think, well, now wait a second. David is is God's man. David has gone through all these things. Hasn't David matured to the point that he will not be under attack? No, and neither will you. And actually, the more that you step up in the mantle of leadership, do you know what happens? The larger that target gets on you as well. Satan wants nothing more than to be able to take down the leaders. Because if he can take down the leaders, he can take down the followers. Because leaders do stupid things, like get in Jeeps and take people down paths that they shouldn't go. Second thing is that your pride, your pride is actually a tool of Satan. 
Whether the threat is external, whether the threat is internal in this passage, both these things pick to this sense of David saying, I do not trust in the resources of God. I am going to trust in my own resources. Count my men. How big are our forces? Pride is any time that I look and say, God, your resources are not enough. I think I can handle this situation. So Satan will attack you. You will be attacked as a leader. Most likely pride is going to be the tool that he's going to use on you. Number three is listen to wise counsel. Now, the, the dynamic between Joab and David, that's a whole nother thing we can unpack. They had a very interesting relationship. Joab is, is David's nephew and was the commander of the forces for most of the time while David was in charge. Yet Joab was one of the few people in the inner circle that could actually question David and was actually one of the few people in the inner circle that actually could disobey David and not be killed. You never really know if they trust each other because even at the very end, David tells Solomon, hey, watch out for Joab and you need to take him out. I mean, it's like Sopranos stuff when you read this thing. But here in this text, in this instance, Joab is in good light. And Joab, as nice as he can, saying, David, this is really not a smart idea. Please don't do this to your people. Yet just like I'm not listening to my wife when I'm in the Jeep, I am not getting my man card revoked. David, in the same sense, says, I'm not listening to this man who's my critic. And I'm going to push forward. Side note, as a leader, sometimes your critics are right. We think, oh, we're gonna isolate ourselves and only hear from people who agree with us. Sometimes you as a leader, you need to listen to your critics because sometimes your critics are right. So you're gonna be under attack. Satan is gonna use pride as a tool of that attack. It's important to listen to wise counsel. Number four is quick, be quick to admit your mistakes. One of the greatest hallmarks of David is not his holy life, he was a sinful man. We see his blemishes. One of the hallmarks of David is he's always quick to repentance. Boy, God, I have screwed up and I am so sorry. May that mark us as leaders as well. In this case, David immediately, even before he's confronted by Gad the prophet, he says, I know I've screwed up. And Lord, please take this away from my people. I'm to blame, my bad. Number five is that your pride affects others. You know, my pride affected me in that I led people up a trail that probably shouldn't have been, had any business being on. David's pride, under God's sovereignty, David's pride cost lives. You as leaders, you have the lives of people in your hands. And sometimes the foolish decisions we make can cost lives. Maybe not cost lives physically, but can cost lives spiritually. When you talk with people who are many times bitter at the church, you know why a lot of times people are bitter at the church? They're bitter at church because of something a leader did in the past. Don't be that leader. And the final thing is that even when we screw up, there's incredible mercy and graciousness on God's part. When you keep reading this passage, we read that David is, is told by the Lord, you need to put an altar right here where I showed up. And David immediately goes to the owner of this property and says, I need to buy this property and buy all the surrounding area. And the, this passage concludes in verse one of, of 22, where it says that David says, this, this is where I'm going to build my temple. This is the same place where God showed up with a sacrificial ram to Abraham and Isaac. This is the same place where for generations after this, that people would be sacrificing to a holy God. And the events on this temple mount will be the events that point to a savior. David's screw ups under God's sovereignty still brings God glory. You're gonna mess up as a leader, but you serve a gracious God and God can take our messes and do incredible things with it. (sighs) 
God has called each of you to lead his flock in some way. Some of you are going to be pastors. Some of you are going to be missionaries. Some of you are going to be professors. But all of you are going to be leading his flock in some way. It's, and leadership is an amazing thing to be entrusted with. Uh, but leadership is such a daunting task. And you cannot do it on your own. On your own, you're going to climb in your Jeep. And you're going to take people places they don't need to be. On your own, you're going to create an organization that actually is going to feed your flesh. And on your own, your followers are just going to be objects. Objects that you're going to use or objects that you're going to abuse. Leadership is a daunting task. So before you step in the Jeep, make sure you know where you're going. Let's pray. Father, may we look at the life of David to understand both our own faults, oh, Father, and our need for a gracious Savior. May we never enter into the task of leadership lightly. May we surround ourselves with people who can question us, but most importantly, may we fall on your mercy. And Father, we do pray on that mercy that comes through your Son and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen.